Hello you all, I'm Black with Yaya. Thank you so much for tuning into this video that was highly demanded for me to review the movie Ease by You. Now I haven't watched this movie since high school, so this time around prepping for this video, I was able to get a better understanding of it. We have a whole bunch of notes that we're going to go over. If you watch the movie, please let me know your interpretation of the movie down below. And while we go over this movie, of course I'm going to be making my crystal dry rub. Y'all see we got a lot of ingredients today because I am making a fresh batch and the crystal dry rub is an all-in-one crystal cleanser that you can use to cleanse and keep your crystals charged if you're doing any moon rituals where you want to charge up your crystals if you want to keep your crystals cleansed and charged throughout the day when you're not wearing them I don't know why I wanted to light the incense for this video to set the tone because we're going to be here for a while because with this movie there was a lot of clues that I feel that were leading up to the overall ending but you guys let me know down below still if I missed anything but I just know I got a whole lot of notes so we're going to need to really relax so starting right out with the beginning of the movie and i feel like this statement plays a role in the entire movie memory is a selection of images some elusive others printed indelibly on the brain so this story is narrated by a young lady that we'll get to know throughout the movie who is reflecting on a particular summer of her life specifically the summer where she was 10 years old and she used voodoo to kill her father first line of narration states I was 10 years old the summer I killed my father. So throughout the story, I am going to be naming and talking about different characters throughout the movie. So let's do a family breakdown, a character breakdown. So when I throw out names, y'all know exactly who I'm talking about. So first we have the grandmother on top who had two children, Louis and Mizell, who are brother and sister. Roz is married to Louis, so they're husband and wife, and they have three kids by the name of Eve, Cicely, and Poe. Now for Cicely, throughout this video, I'll call her Cicely, but Cicely. And Louis had a mistress slash lover by the name of Maddie Monroe. I will refer to her as Miss Monroe in this video. And her husband is Larry Monroe, and I will refer to him as Mr. Monroe. Mazel has a husband by the name of Harry and then later has a boyfriend by the name of Julian and we have a psychic lady named Elzara and I will refer to her as psychic lady. This family lived in a town that was named after a slave. There was a general named Jean Paul Baptiste who was sick but his life was saved by an African slave by the name of Eve. And in exchange, General Jean Paul Baptiste freed her and gave her a piece of land by the bayou. And from there, she had 16 kids by him and the family that I just mentioned are the descendants of Eve and General Jean Paul Baptiste. And we know that Eve specifically is named after the healer that saved Jean Paul Baptiste. And this story is narrated from her point of view. So we are at a party at Roz and Lewis house just from the setting of this film we can tell that Roz and Lewis has a very nice lifestyle. The home was fantastic. Everyone was dressed really nice. They're having a good time. But Eve's good time is interrupted because her father chooses to dance with her sister Cicely instead of her. And we'll later find out that this is a reoccurring thing. So Eve is tired of it. She storms out. She goes to the shed trying to gather her emotions. She ends up falling asleep. But then she is awakened by a glass shattering due to the fact that her father is basically hunching on another woman in the shed. And throughout this film, we'll find out that the father is a rolling stone wherever he lays his hat was his home. Or I should say wherever he leaves his medicine bag because he is a doctor and he sees people throughout the area and in the town. But he sees them in a variety of ways and we'll see. And the woman that Eve saw her father interacting with in the shed was not her beautiful mother Roz, but Miss Monroe. And we are going to hear a lot about Miss Monroe through this movie okay she was a loyal side chick she was in there so eve is shocked shook surprised by what she sees she gives out a gasp and her father hears it he turns around he grabs her he comforts her he gives her the whole you know daddy love you right and then she's like but do you love mom though of course he says yes but eve has a follow-up question and she asks why don't you ever dance with me at parties you only dance with me when we're alone and then her dad promised her that he'll start dancing with her at all the parties so it's getting late eve go upstairs to prepare for bed she's putting on her pajamas her sister asks her where were you during the party eve you could tell she's emotional she says i was talking to dad and cicely says before you were talking to dad where'd you go and then she says i went to the shed and she starts to cry cicely asks 
asks what happened eve basically tries to explain to her like hey i saw dad and miss monroe they were touching and rubbing and cicely's like no that's not what happened and this is the first instance where we see memory playing a role cicely did not want to hear about her father touching and rubbing on no other woman so she tells eve no this is what happened let me explain dad and miss monroe went to the shed to get some more wine dad told her a joke they laughed they giggled they touched each other just from laughing so hard and that's it that's what happened and you can see the memory replay in the movie of a different interaction of them just laughing because he told a joke and eve asks her are you sure and cicely says yes i'm sure trust me dad wants nothing to do with that cow so in this instance we see cicely switching up something that happened in reality to make herself feel better because she didn't want to hear about her dad cheating on her mom she refused to believe it so not only did she change her recollection of what happened but eve's recollection of what happened even though she was there so this was the first account that we can see cicely likes to protect her father we'll see this again throughout the story that i tell but cicely wants to protect her father by any means necessary even if that means morphing eve's memory so as the girls are getting ready for bed aunt mazelle and her husband harry are getting ready to leave the party lewis and harry are being the drunk uncles at a family reunion fighting each other because lewis wanted to make sure that mazelle drove because because Harry was drunk as a skunk and so was Lewis but still even with him being drunk he wanted to make sure that Mazel drove just because Harry was just too intoxicated to get behind the wheel so while all this commotion is going on Cicely and Eve come down and Cicely we can tell is trying to take on the adult role she's like listen all this commotion going on y'all gonna wake up the neighbors Roz is like shouldn't y'all be in bed and Cicely's like not until daddy comes in so we are getting clues with the infatuation that Cicely has for her father. But Marzell was able to get the keys from Harry. They hopped in the car. They're saying goodnight to everyone. And in this particular scene, I wanted y'all to pay close attention to it. So Marzell is in the driver's seat. Harry is in the passenger seat. He's saying goodnight to everyone individually. Goodnight, Roz. Goodnight, Louis. Goodnight, Cicely. Goodnight, Eve. But when he says goodnight to Eve as he's waving goodbye, there's a certain eye contact that they make. And then after he waves, he tilts his head back and his hat falls off so the night has passed and eve is awakened by a disturbing dream and simultaneously she's finding out it's reality in this dream she's having a vision of a car crashing and while she's waking up from that dream hyperventilating she hears her mom in the background saying oh no it's harry then finding out that harry passed away because marzell and harry leaving the party got into a car accident and harry unfortunately passed away now stopping right here and usually in films when someone's about to pass away you will see scenes like this where they hat may fall off or a woman may experience her last moment of freedom she's in the car with the top down and her scarf is blowing in the wind it's always a sign of peace and freedom right before they pass away usually that's done in movies to allude to death or transition like that final I'm at peace. So getting back to the movie, we see in the next scene, time has passed and Eve is laying out a flower for her uncle Harry who has passed away. But also within the same area, she laid out a flower for her uncle Harry. She laid out a flower for her uncle Menard and she laid out a flower for her uncle Anderson, all three of which was married to Mazel. So Harry was her third husband that passed away. So, of course, with this third hit, Mazel is just tired. She's depressed. She's sad. Eve has to go over to her house to help drag her out of bed because she has clients coming. Eve is like, look, come on, let's get ready. You have people coming. You don't look that bad. But, of course, you just lost her husband, so she's just a little bit out of it. Eve is trying to make her feel better by reflecting on her husband's asking, so which one did you love the most? She asks while she's dusting off all of their pictures that's on. Seems like what it would be an altar with all of them laid out in a row on top of the fireplace. So Eve asks her, which one did you love the most? And Mazella explains that they all were different. Anderson was the most handsome. Harry was the sweetest and Maynard loved me the most. So while she's reflecting, she shares with Eve, when I was your age, before I did any of this counseling, I could look at a complete stranger and see their whole life clear as day. But I looked at each of my husbands and never saw a thing. Blind to my own life. 
And usually this is just simply because universal law, you have to go through obstacles and bad times as well. You can't use your own gift to your advantage because you may skip over some obstacles that had lessons in return. So you may be blind to certain things in your life because those are situations that you have to go through. And if you had like a cheat sheet to it, you may try to avoid it, but then you're going to be avoiding a lifelong lesson that you needed in the end. But I could see why she's frustrated. She could see everybody else's future. She's helping everybody else. But yet she has to go through losing her husband three times. And most tarot readers prefer to get readings from other people because sometimes when you're reading yourself, if you're really not experienced in it or you're trying it out for the first time, it can be hard to remain objective because of course you don't want to get a card that's bad. So you may try to flip it and twist it to the point where it's in your favor. Usually tarot readers have a tarot reader that they go to so they could just have an objective perspective. So from the film so far, we could put two and two together and not only see that Mizell, Aunt Mizell, is a seer but Eve as well. And of course, Aunt Mizell knows about Eve's gifts as well, especially when her clients are getting ready to come. She tells Eve to disappear and if she's quiet enough, she could probably listen in as well. And that's exactly what Eve did. She was able to hide out in the corner, listen in on Aunt Mizell's first client. So with the first client, her concern was where is her son? She hasn't seen her son for a long time. So Aunt Mizell has her place her hands over her hands. And then Mizell, we could see her really tap into her gift. She begins to get a vision of the son basically strung out on drugs. So she tells the client, you'll find your son next Tuesday in Detroit in St. Michael's Hospital. Then the woman is like, okay, what's exactly wrong? And she tells her, your son is strung out on drugs. You need to pray for strength during this time. Also, I want to mention one thing about this scene. This individual, the client, was dressed up in a Easter Sunday church outfit. I wonder if they were doing that to show that even the people who had different beliefs trusted Mizell and her visions as well. But she was dressed like she was going to church. And I'm like, well, 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 look at that. It's not so evil and demonic after all, is it? So Mizell's next client is wondering where did all her money go? And Mizell has a vision that her niece spent it all. Of course, the woman is crying because she's trying to figure out how she's going to live with no money. Her niece done spent it all. So Mizell goes over to her little treasure chest and pulls out some supplies for the client. So Mizell tells her to do this and I suggest y'all write this down. Get a small bag of chamois, place in a piece of lodestone, add John the Conqueror root, tie it with a piece of devil's shoestring, and in your right hand sprinkle five drops of holy water and keep the bag next to your skin. And that reminds me to add in some devil's claw to the crystal dry rub before I forget, just a pinch. So Eve has seen her Aunt Mizell at work and of course she is shocked by what she saw. So during Aunt Mizell and Eve's walk after seeing all her clients, Eve tells her, you told daddy you don't practice voodoo. Then Aunt Mizell says, oh, she was desperate. And Eve asks, well, will it work? And Aunt Mizell says, we'll see. But what if it doesn't? And Aunt Mizell says, well, I'm sure she ain't gonna sue me. And I feel like that was important to mention because when it comes to voodoo, any type of rituals, no matter what you practice, it's no guarantee that it will work. Depends on your intention. So it's not Aunt Mizell's place to say, yep, it's gonna work if the client herself doesn't believe in it, doesn't follow the right instructions, just brushes it off. So that's why it's kind of like, we'll see. We'll see if she's able to add in her own intention and follow through with it. So this is just a brief rundown of something else that happened in the movie that we can kind of brush over. So so Roz finds out that her husband is cheating. She had actually addressed the lady from before, tells her, listen, I got his kids. You need to back off all that good stuff. Eve makes her rounds with her father to go around and see clients. And she's getting hints that her father is cheating on her mother because with one particular client, he decides to stay a little longer with her because she was like, well, can you help me with something else? I have a different type of pain. So he tells Eve to go outside basically while he her. So again, he goes around and sees patients and treats them in a variety of ways. So now Roz and Mizell are taking a walk into town to go to the little farmer's market that they have. And we know that Roz just found out that her husband is cheating. So she's just reflecting on him. Like when I first met him, I thought he was just so handsome. The way he treated people, he healed his patients. And you know what? I thought that this man right here, he's a healer. He's going to be a good family man. But then he just turns out to be like any other man. So Roz is explaining this to Mizell, who is Louis' sister. 
and she states that her and her brother are a lot alike and with this part i was wondering with Roz mentioning that he was a healer family separate from marrying into this family did each one have like different gifts where Mazel is a seer Lewis the brother is a healer but he just uses his talent he just takes advantage of people using his talent I was wondering does every is everyone blessed like with a different gift but that's just a side thought so they're walking around the farmer's market and they see a local psychic who is always there and Roz is like come on Mazel let's get a reading and Mazel doesn't want to get a reading from her she's like listen I got a real talent this right here is just a sideshow she doesn't believe in her gifts but Roz continues on wanting a reading and Roz even tells her like I feel like you got a case of professional jealousy which happens a lot in the spiritual community usually people who have similar gifts they like to say that the other person is a fraud just so it could boost their clientele when at the end of the day they could both could be talented but due to jealousy they feel like they have to like bash another person in order for them to rise up so yeah you just want to keep in mind of that as you interact with different people in the spiritual community who have different gifts sometimes it could get a little catty like with everything else so Roz proceeds to get a reading the psychic makes Roz lay out a bag of bones and while reading the bones the way they are placed she can see that Roz is in pain there is an end to her problem but not one that she imagined and the psychic tells her to stay quiet and wait sometimes a soldier will fall in his own sword keep that in mind and the psychic tells her in three years time you'll be happy again and look to your children one dollar because that's how much it costs to get a reading, one dollar. And Roz is like, that's it? In three years time, I'll be happy again? And the psychic's kind of like, mm-hmm, yep, that's what I said, one dollar. So Mazel decides to get a reading. She sits down, she places one dollar into the jar, and the psychic tells her, some things are better left unsaid. And Mazel says, I paid you a dollar, old woman, now tell me my fortune. And then the psychic tells her, I don't need no cat bones to tell you your future. You're cursed, a black widow. The next man that marries you is a dead man. And who wants to hear that? Mizell flips out. She throws the jar of dollars on the ground. It breaks. She storms off with Roz. They're rushing down the street. Mizell almost get hit by a bus, but right before it hits her, she's faint. She faints because she has a vision of a child getting hit by some form of transportation. She couldn't place the face on it, but later we'll see that vision play out in reality later on in the movie. So of course, with Roz just getting this reading saying, look to your children, Mizell having a vision of a child getting hit she immediately wants to put her kids on lockdown no one is leaving this house until Mazel says it's safe to do so because she's like listen the psychic told me one thing Mazel telling me another thing it's something to do with y'all so I need to keep y'all in my sight of course no one is happy with that because who wants to be on lockdown in the middle of summer and you know the daddy not staying in the house so he still wants to go see his clients and you know who else isn't happy with this Cicely because right now she's going through this awkward teenage phase where she wants to be an adult but yet she still is a kid so she's talking back to her mom saying that she doesn't want to stay in the house so the grandmother threatened to hit Cicely because she's just being slick at the mouth and Lewis is like you better not threaten my child and then Eve is like you let her threaten me so again we see the form of favoritism that's between Lewis and his daughter Cicely the oldest daughter time has passed the kids tries to keep themselves entertained but it's just so much entertainment you're going to do in the house Eve is getting frustrated that her dad isn't there and then her mom tells her "Well, are listen your dad is working and Eve is like he ain't always work and I could tell you that and Mizell hears that so she snatches Eve away and she tells her is that any way to protect your mother's feelings and Mizell tells her which I found was weird you guys let me know what you think that this random threat meant Mizell tells Eve if you cause any type of emotional damage to your mother I promise I will harm you she even says she will kill her I'm like okay where did that threat come from that seemed a little bit harsh but I'm like, okay, let's continue. Y'all let me know what y'all got from that. I still haven't put two and two together why she got that serious about it. But they did use that throughout the film. Like, I'll kill you. I'm going to kill her. It was a lot of kill threats going on. So in this scene as well, we get a real close look because it's actually shown in the reflection of Mizell while she's telling the story. We can see it play out in her reflection in the background. Very good cinematography. But we get to see what happened between one of her husbands, Maynard, and her lover, Hosea. She said that she felt like when she was with Hosea, her whole body was on fire. So with all that passion going on, Hosea came to their house one day. Maynard, the husband, answers the door and he was basically like, I'm here for Mazel. And he tells Mazel, go pack your bags. And that's exactly what Mazel did. She says she ran upstairs to go pack her bags. And the husband, Maynard, tells the lover, Hosea, I don't care who you are. She ain't going nowhere. Then Hosea pulls out a gun 
on the husband Maynard. And then Maynard walks up to the gun, walking up so close that the gun is now pointed at his chest. And Mizell during this time is witnessing all this going on. So seeing her husband Maynard stand up for her like that, that's when she realized that she really does love her husband and she wanna stick beside him. So she tells Hosea, listen, I'm not going nowhere and told him to leave. And then boom, Hosea shoots Maynard in the chest. And that's how one of her husbands died. So speaking of lovers and husbands, some time has passed and Mazel is getting a new client. And the client comes up to the door and he says, hi, my name is Julian Gray Raven. Folks around here say you can see the future. And his problem is he wants to know where his wife is. Come to find out, Mazel sees a vision that she's up there loving on another man. So she tells him that, listen, your wife done ran off with another man. And then all of a sudden you see this man getting ready to paint a portrait of Mazel. They kiss and now this is her new love interest speaking of running off somewhere kids again are still supposed to be on lockdown until mazel says it's clear to do so or till the vision fulfills itself and sicily done ran off in the town the mother thinks that sicily is missing she's calling the police department to stay on lookout because she doesn't know where her daughter is and then her daughter sicily comes storming in the house with her little raincoat on with some red lipstick on and the mother is like listen where have you been and so she says i went to to see daddy and i also went to the beauty salon and then she takes off her hoodie and she cut and she had her hair cut because her hair was down her back now her hair is cut and styled in the same style as her mom and she has on red lipstick and you know back in the day they say oh if you wear red lipstick you fast so maybe that was just a type of symbolism of her supposedly supposed to be fast and she says i had to take a bus cross the train tracks and everything basically trying to say listen you worried about us getting hit by something i don't went outside across the train tracks with the bus been outside for real and ain't nothing happened so basically trying to prove like you up here worried for nothing and of course with all this back talk the mom slaps her and then later on Roz and her daughter Cicely has a talk and Roz explains that when she was her age she was just like her which makes me think that's why they're bumping heads and she tells her listen if you break my rules again I'm gonna really lock you in your room. So Roz and Cicely are downstairs when she's explaining this and then Roz the mom tells Cicely you can go to bed I'm gonna wait up for your father tonight I don't want you waiting up for him anymore because Cicely would stay up at night until her father got home each and every night but Roz the mother no longer wants her daughter doing that so Cicely cries and runs off and then when the dad gets home Roz and Louis the father get into a big argument you can hear them all over the house is storming as well so it's just you can feel the tension so now in the next scene we can see Mazel and her new boo Julian sitting on a swing and Julian tells her like listen I have to go and find my wife so you can see Mazel get uncomfortable and he tells her I'm going to find my wife to divorce her so I can marry you. And Mazel is like, listen, you can't marry me. I'm a cursed woman and I'm barren because she couldn't have any children. Explain everything that's going on and Julian tells her, you're not barren, you're just wounded. And while this beautiful moment is going on, boom, we hear an accident happen, a kid got hit, unfortunately passed away. But the kids are happy because they're like, oh my gosh, this kid just got hit by a bus. We can go outside now. The vision fulfilled itself. The vision that Mazel had of a kid getting hit wasn't one of us. It was one of those other kids. So now we are free. So the kids are excited. Eve goes upstairs to tell her sister Cicely. She's like, listen, the kid got hit by a bus. We free now. We could go outside. She's excited. She's jumping on her bed. And then Cicely tells her to go away and pushes her off the bed. And while she's on the floor, she sees that Cicely has some blood stains in her underwear and so she says oh just because you got your period you think you could act like a monster and so she begins to taunt her like any 10 year old would do Cicely got her period Cicely got her period and Cicely went ballistic she started chasing her all around the house threatening I'll kill her I'll kill her they're running outside she ends up tackling her hitting her strangling her like she's beating her up like that is not her sister so the mom calls the dad, let her know what happened because she didn't know why she went crazy like that. She thought she was having a seizure. And then the dad tries to go in there and check on her. And she didn't even want her father touching her. I'm not sure if she was ashamed that she had her period. Maybe it was like a girl thing. But she didn't even want her father, the man that she's so infatuated with and loved so much, 
to even tend to her. So some weeks has passed. Cicely is still acting strange. She isn't talking to her mom, not eating, not wanting to leave her room. And she's seeing a psychiatrist and they suggest that maybe Cicely needs a break from the family. And Cicely agrees to do so. So she's having a sit down meeting with her parents and she's saying, listen, I'll go away for some time with grandma eve is eavesdropping on this she hears it she's so upset that her sister is about to leave they so later on eve is pleading with cicely like tell me what's wrong why are you leaving don't leave me here i'll die without you did i do something wrong she's trying to figure out what's the problem of why she's acting weird and why she decided to leave and then cicely says of course it wasn't you eve and then cicely begins to explain what's going on she asks her sister you remember that night when our parents were arguing? Part of it was about me. Dad let me stay with him when we were supposed to be on lockdown. The other thing they were fighting about was Miss Monroe. She's just been hanging around his office out in the open. Then Eve asks, so now you believe me? And Cicely says, yeah i believed you then so you may be wondering so why'd you try to morph this girl memory if you believed her in the, in the first place but of course it's trying to protect her father and then she continued after the argument i waited until mama went upstairs and dad was still downstairs so i went downstairs to him after the argument i'm thinking like maybe he'll leave us maybe he'll divorce us so i wanted to make him feel better I feel like I should say trigger warning for this next part. So just a little heads up. You may want to tap forward a little bit. She walked up to her father and began to massage his shoulders. He's a little drunk at the time. So he's just indulging in his daughter trying to make him feel good. She sat on his lap and kissed him in the mouth. And then he kissed her again, beginning to make out with his daughter, Cicely. Of course, Cicely is uncomfortable and she pushes him away. And then the father slaps her to the ground. Which, of course, we know from before he never wanted to hit his children. And Eve is hearing this story and she's like, I'll kill him for hurting you. So now we're at the scene where Cicely is leaving and Eve is sitting on the porch with Aunt Mizell. They're watching her leave. And as Cicely is sitting in the back seat looking at her sister, she goes like this Shh, for her to be quiet. And Eve nods her head in agreement, basically telling her not to tell anyone what she told her. And Mazel is looking at it and she sees what's going on. And then the car with Cicely rides off with her father, Louis, driving. So now later on that night, we're getting another Aunt and Niece talk. I love the one-on-ones that we get to see between Aunt Mazel and Eve. So Aunt Mazel is explaining to Eve that she feels like she lost so much in life that she has to find new things to lose. And she understands that everyone goes through pain. But sometimes when that pain go unexplained, it's just basically like that person being unhappy with their life in the end because they lived their life with unexplained misery. So Aunt Mazel is going down this deep talk and reflection and Eve interrupts and says, can you kill somebody with voodoo? And Mazel is like, um, I don't know, maybe if you had one of them dolls and you stuck needles in it or something. And with her saying this, this is my second time noticing that she's playing dumb to what voodoo is. Before when Eve told her, oh, you told daddy you don't practice voodoo. And when she asked, will that pouch work for the client? She said, hmm, I don't know, we'll see. And here she's like, hmm, I don't know, maybe if you had one of those dolls and stuck needles in it. So we see that Mazel tries to hide her other gifts of being a crafter as well by just playing dumb to like, well, I don't know. I guess because Eve is a little too young to really know what else goes into having her vision and being able to assist people. But then I noticed, okay, Mizell is just playing dumb. And Mizell asks her, so why do you ask that? And Eve is like, I don't know. And then Mizell is like, give me your hands. So she asks for Eve's hands to get a vision, but she tries to get a vision, but then she's immediately blocked. And Mizell is like, fine, if keeping secrets is what we are doing. And this scene reminded me of being able to protect your energy when it comes to visions. People who have visions have psychic abilities because sometimes people will just try to walk up to you and tap into your energy. I don't know if you just ever floating around a store and someone's like, hey, your grandmother has a message for you. This is a and they just start to read you and you're a little bit caught off guard. And this reminds me, quick side story. I was in the mall with my cousin one time and this random lady came up to me. She was like, hi, I'm a psychic. I see that there's a lot of people around you who have jealous energy that you need to watch out for bring guard yourself for here you go here's my car all reasons are twenty dollars it's like why would you just walk up on someone and try to read them granted usually people who do this are just saying general stuff that everyone can relate to like if i say right now someone watching this video has a hard decision to make everybody watching this video has some type of decision to make whether it's taking your son out of a school whether you should leave your job whether you're gonna get a side part or a middle part general messages like that but sometimes people can be a little bit intrusive intrusive 
when it comes to your energy and trying to read you. That's why I don't even watch the readers who try to read celebrities because I'm a person that believe you have to have an individual's permission in order to read them. And if not, you're just being intrusive. And with this, the analogy I use, imagine if someone named Sarah, right? I just brought a new house. I'm gonna invite Sarah over. She could see my nice flooring, the panels on the wall, the chandelier, the pictures, the couches that I have. She gets to see the whole nine because I invited her into my house. So she gets to really see what's going on. So she may go and tell someone else, oh my gosh, Yaya has this beautiful home. She has this beautiful chandelier. Everything is so nice. She's able to tell it in detail because I invited her into my home where let's just say there's a Jacob. Jacob wants to see my house. He heard I got a new house, but he's not invited over. So he just goes on the property and he's going like this, looking through a window. He's able to see the flooring. He's able to see the picture, but he can't see the chandelier. He can't see the nice panels on the wall. He can't see every detail that Sarah had because Sarah was invited while Jacob is trespassing. So I use that analogy for psychic readers. When you give a reader your permission, they are they're going to be able to see everything clearer like Sarah did because she was invited in. So she gets to get up close and personal while Jacob can't see everything because he's trespassing. He doesn't have permission to come in. So he has a limited view. So not only is he trying to tap into my energy without permission, he's trespassing as well because he wasn't invited over. That's how I think about it. So I feel like with all readings, you need the individual's permission. That's how I feel about it. But you know, everybody do their own thing. So in this case, Eve was really able to block her aunt Mazel from looking into what she wants to do. And we all have the power to do so. Then Mazel continues to tell her, you can't kill someone with voodoo. That's ridiculous. Which I believe because I feel like that's playing God. And with my belief of saying that I don't feel like you could kill someone with voodoo because that's like playing God and you can't play or try to trick Father Time because everyone has free will over their universal contract. This also reminds me that I want to mention that I forgot to mention before. In the beginning of the movie, after Eve catches her dad cheating basically with Miss Monroe, when they're outside talking, the mother comes downstairs to see what's going on to see what they're talking about. She tells Eve that she needs to get ready for bed and don't forget to say your prayers. And then they both say together, don't cheat the man upstairs as their signature prayer, which alludes to my belief in this situation where she's saying you can't kill someone with voodoo. I believe that's like trying to play God. And then they have a prayer saying, don't cheat the man upstairs. Like don't try to beat God to the punch. If you get what I'm saying, don't try to play God or whatever higher power you believe in. So Eve makes her way to the farmer's market. She's actually on her way to go see the psychic lady, but she runs into Mr. Monroe, Mrs. Monroe, the side chick's husband. And even in the beginning of the film, we see them dancing together. So it's public knowledge that she has a husband. So Eve's entire mission during this moment was to drop hints that his wife is cheating. And this is how she did it. She asks, Mr. Monroe, are you still teaching and he says yes and she's like i know that's a long drive from the campus you must get home real late and he's like yeah sometimes if the weather's bad i'll just decide to stay on campus but i'll always try to make it home so miss monroe don't get too lonely and eve says hmm she doesn't seem like the lonely type well my dad gets home real late too but my mom is the lonely type not like Miss Monroe and my dad. Basically saying my mom gets lonely, but for some reason, my dad and Miss Monroe doesn't seem to get lonely. Leaving it for him to put two and two together that her dad and his wife got a little thing going on. So Eve went to the farmer's market to see the psychic lady. She stole $20 off the dresser from her dad and even stole a couple strands of his hair as well to bring to the psychic lady. And remember from before, the psychic lady only charged $1 for her services for a reading at least so when she seen that eve had a 20 i guess she got the vip experience because she was actually able to go to her house to have a session to see what exactly she wanted so eve explains to her that she wants a family member dead that harmed another family member and oddly enough the psychic lady says is it your aunt mazelle and she's like no it's another family member 
in my head i'm like why she guessed my zell so quick why would she assume the family member she wants dead out of all people is aunt my zell it's even a theory i seen going around where people believe that the psychic lady is the one that put a curse on my zell but y'all let me know because she seemed a little bit too they seemed a little bit too head buddy where it seemed like they had some type of history elzara the psychic lady i keep calling her psychic lady but elzara explains to her that she's going to need some hair and eve is like boom got some strands of hair and then the psychic lady tells her okay we'll come back thursday night so eve is excited she's practicing she's poking her stuffed animal with needles practicing on how she's going to use the voodoo doll and be able to have control of it she comes on thursday thinking that she's coming to pick up a voodoo doll but there's no voodoo doll to pick up. And Elzebra tells her there is no voodoo doll. I use the wax coffin method. I put the hair in the mouth of a snake, put it in the coffin, put the top on the coffin and buried it rest to the necks of the Baptiste family. Basically put it in her, fam her family's burial site. Elzebra also says they should be dead by now. And Eve is like, no, they're not dead. I thought there was a voodoo doll. I needed that doll. She's freaking out because she wanted the voodoo doll. I guess because she wanted control of it. So just in case she changed her mind, she can like stop poking the needle or just do it whenever she gets angry. I guess she wanted that tangible sense of the spell where she can have complete control of it just in case she changed her mind. But in this moment, she realizing that it's permanent. The spell is done. The psychic lady is like, look, you paid me $20. So I did my job. And she was like, I thought you were sure. I thought you were certain that you wanted them dead. So she's running out crying because now she realized what she asked for is permanent. She runs to go look for her father to find her father in the juke joint. Basically a bar, a hole in the wall. And of course, in this bar, she sees her father cheesed up all up in Miss Monroe's face. So she runs up to her father. Also, y'all, for this, if you ever get your crystal dry rub and it's a little bit lumpy, I put crushed crystals into the crystal dry rub as well. So if you get yours and it has like an amethyst piece or like a clear quartz piece, it's on purpose. It's not a mistake. Okay, so... Some of it may feel a little heavy because whichever bag gets a crystal, I just bag it up. Whoever gets it, gets it. So you may get some little pieces of crystal in there as well to actually help activate it and charge your crystals up in there. So just a little side note. So she runs up to her father and she tells him like, listen, I want you to come back home with me. And then her dad is like, what's wrong? Did something happen? She's like, no, I just want you to come home. Mind you, Miss Monroe is sitting up there looking like, girl, why are you interrupting my play? And then the father just says, okay well give me a few more minutes to say goodbye to miss monroe and then eve looks at miss monroe and is like okay hurry up eve is outside impatiently waiting for her dad to come out so they can leave and then she sees this shadow of a man walking towards her down the train tracks she couldn't make out who it was until he got closer and then once she was able to see his face she said oh hi mr monroe and then he didn't address her he just thorned past her then it took her a few seconds to realize, oh shoot, that's Mr. Monroe. He's about to go inside to this bar to see his wife hugged up with my dad. So she runs in behind him. So Mr. Monroe steps up into the juke joint to see his wife all cheesy and smiley up in Lewis' face. And then Lewis spots him and says, oh, you're just on time to have a last drink with us playing in that man's face and he says i don't think so lewis you effing my wife and lewis is like don't be crazy you must be drunk and then he snatches up his wife and pulls her in front of him like you like her she beautiful ain't she and of course miss monroe now she looking all shook like she don't know what's going on and mr monroe is like are you effing her i trusted you lewis and you effing her i loved you lewis and lewis says i loved you too and he says listen you so much as speak to my wife again and i'll kill you do you understand? Then the bartender tells him to take it outside because he didn't want all that riffraff in his bar. So they're walking outside and Lewis just could not let it go. He tells him, listen, you go home, old man, and sleep that whiskey off and apologize to me tomorrow. And then Monroe turns, Mr. Monroe turns around and says, you speak to her again, Lewis, you dead. Eve is pleading with her dad, like, please, let's go home. Let's go home. Lewis could not let it go. And he turns around again and says, good night, Maddie saying goodnight to Miss Monroe. Lewis pulls out a gun and kills him. And then you see Lewis go to the ground and you see Eve beginning to cry and scream and fall to the ground as well as a train passes by. And this scene is the exact vision that Mizell had right before she was about to get hit by a bus. The vision from before that made her pass out where Roz thought it was one of her children being hit. 
it was actually a train passing by and Eve falling from just being shocked and scared that her dad just got shocked. So that scene of her falling, the train passing by, that was the vision that Mizell got. And the next scene, we're at the funeral. You can tell everybody is sad. You know Cicely's sad. She all distraught. She had to get carried out. And Eve is boohoo crying, crying because she lost her father. But you could tell there is a sense of guilt as well because she feels like she's the person that did this. I went to the psychic lady. I asked her to kill my father and now he's dead. So some time has passed. We can see Eve is outside sitting on a tree branch. She's just crying and reflecting and then her aunt Mizell comes over and she tells her about a dream that she had where she was swimming in the sky just floating around and then in her peripheral vision she can see her another version of her drowning in the same air that's keeping her afloat then she heard her brother Louis voice say don't look back and so she decided to keep going so she took that as a sign that her old cursed self is no longer there and with that she feels like it's safe enough to marry Julian and then she told Eve that she had a message for her that came from her father saying that he still owes her that dance basically giving Eve a sign that listen your dad still loves you he still cares about you and he's still going to give you that dance and you could tell it was a message because Mizell was not around when he first told Eve that in the first place y'all this video is so long I'm like I might as well start bagging this up Got my little scale out. Eve decides to take a visit into her dad's office. She smells his hat and she puts it on. Another scene with the hat after death. And again, with Eve being present when her father died, that is the second occurrence that took place where Eve is there right before someone passes away. Then we get another scene with the hat being involved with death as well. So while she's going through his stuff, she finds a letter that is addressed to his sister, Mazel. So in this letter, it's Lewis basically saying that he couldn't believe that Mazel would accuse him of harming his own daughter. He says, I adored her and I allowed her to adore me. It was a sweet indulgence, but nothing prepared me for what happened the night of the storm. Roz and I got into a fight and I knew Cecily couldn't sleep throughout a fight like that so I wasn't surprised when she came downstairs. Maybe I was even waiting for her. She massaged my neck and I wallowed in the comfort. Mazel, the first kiss was the sweetest kiss a daughter could give a drunken guilt-ridden father. In the next moment it had gone wrong. From my, scotch, from my scotch haze it took me a second to realize my daughter was kissing me like a woman. I was so stunned that I hit her. She fell to the floor. The look she gave me almost stopped my heart. I wish I could have that moment back. I would have held her and comforted her and we would have talked through the confusion. I would have put her to bed with boundaries in place. I knew I couldn't betray her trust by telling you or Roz, forgive me. So with the story the father just told, we can tell that is a totally different story from what Cicely had said from before because she stated like the father pushed up on her and then hit her as retaliation. So Eve storms outside to find her sister and she says, you lied to me, you're a liar. I believed you, I hated him for you. Dad wrote a letter to Mizell explaining what happened. Cicely begins to cry and she says he hurt me Eve he hurt me so badly I wanted to die Eve says tell me what happened Cicely says I can't and Eve held out her hands like Mizell does for her clients and she begins to get a vision of what happened but it's just flashes of her being slapped on the ground looking at her father in disappointment but it just didn't make sense it was just random flashes of stuff and then Cicely says I don't remember what happened and Cicely begins to cry even harder Eve comforted her and she said it's fine it's okay so even Cicely decided to take the letter and just let it drown into the swamp so Mizell could never read it and this also made me think about you know how they say waters hold secrets so it's symbolism to the water holding the secret of what happened between the two stories who knows what's true Cicely's version or the father's version and then we hear the narrator's voice again which is the older version of Eve because of course she's telling this story in past tense and she says the summer my father said good night I was 10 years old. Whereas before we know that she said the summer I killed my father, I was 10 years old. So now with this transitioning to him saying good night and it's alluding to when Harry said good night to Eve, he passed away. When Lewis said good night to Maddie, he passed away as a saying of being as a statement of transition. 
It seems that Eve is now taking the guilt off of her. Like I didn't kill him. He decided to say good night. It was his own decision in a way which goes back to what the psychic said. This is my interpretation of it, which to me is what the psychic said before. Sometimes a soldier falls on his own sword. Like basically he couldn't let his ego go. He couldn't let the situation go. So he just died from his own disobedience in a way his own ego then the narrator goes on to say that she has a gift of sight like so many other people in her family before the truth changes colors depending on light and tomorrow can be clearer than yesterday and with her saying tomorrow can be clearer than yesterday it reminds me it makes me think that now she's thinking on the situation with a clearer perspective even though it happened so long ago now that she's older she has a she, now that she's older she's more wiser she's able to look at the situation differently which shows why she switched from the summer i killed my father i was 10 years old to the summer i to, to, to the summer where my father said good night i was 10 years old that shift in perspective makes me think that it's alluding to her having a clear understanding of what happened that summer and that ladies and gentlemen is the end of the movie but not the end of this video because my first question to y'all is do you think that it was the voodoo that killed the father or do you feel like it was his own demise due to his behavior and his sneakiness was it karma or do you feel like the voodoo actually had a role in it? So here are some interpretations that I have. And you guys let me know what you think. So like I said before, in the beginning of the movie where the mother told Eve to say her prayers. And she said, don't cheat the man upstairs. That made me think about don't try to jump the gun be hasty make rational decisions that's taking the control away from someone else so maybe if that's a continuous prayer that they had and a rule that they went by maybe the voodoo didn't have an impact on it and then if you think of the order of the movie eve eve started dropping hints to mr monroe before she seen the psychic lady like right before she went to go see her to tell her basically to do some voodoo on her father she already started dropping hints to mr monroe that his wife was cheating with her father so maybe that seed was already planted and mr monroe was going to do what he was going to do no matter what because that was that thought was already stirring in his head also what do you think happened between the daughter and the father do you believe Sicily's version do you believe the father's version do you feel like the truth will never be revealed and then that goes to what the narrator said basically saying the colors of truth can change depending on the light basically the story can change depending on the storyteller do you feel that we'll never know the truth it's just a mystery and up to the viewer to decide or have you taken the side based on the movie for me I mean, in situations like that, I'm always pro believe the kids. So I guess I will have to say believe the kids. But then again, it's just the way that Sicily, before Sicily was trying to change Eve's memory to protect her father. But in this story, she switched up the story to make her father the attacker. Like she wasn't trying to protect him in this situation. So it makes me think if throughout this movie, he was always trying to protect him, protect him, protect him. And now all of a sudden it was, he was the attacker. Are you telling the truth now? Because you protected him as much as you could to now you really have to acknowledge the truth because before she will always try to protect him. So for me, it's like, okay, if you're not trying to protect him now, that means something really bad had to happen. And then she, all of a sudden she caught her period right after. So was there like something else that happened along with that? And then again, the way the father died, y'all know I'm always thinking about symbolism and placement in movies. He died right next to a railroad track and the person that killed him walked across the railroad. And usually, sometimes you'll see dead animals on railroad tracks. That means that someone just left a sacrifice. So he was killed right next to a railroad track. So it showed some type of sacrifice. So was he the sacrifice that broke the curse for his sister? Because before they said, before she said, oh, we're a lot alike. So with him dying, was that the sacrificial lamb for her curse to be broken because now it's like okay the curse is broken i feel comfortable marrying julian i let the old me go she had that dream so was he the sacrifice for it to happen with him saying don't look back basically saying like i took care of it it's a done deal but then again that wasn't the intention behind his death his death was due to his own demise or did voodoo play a role in it? And then again, I'm thinking, did voodoo play a role in it? Because with voodoo and with spells and with any type of ritual that you're doing, it's all about your intention. So with the person who actually wanted done is now changing her mind. 
does the intention change does is the spell null and void because now she's starting to regret it did she really want him dead in the first place or was she just emotional and that's why she wanted to backpedal once she realized that the spell was permanent so many questions so many ways to dissect this then if you think about the story that was told the roles reverse where the story was told where my Zell lover killed her husband and now in this situation lewis lover was killed by her husband so is that switch a way to undo what was done to my since the prophecy relived itself in an alternate way i like that they were able to let the viewer decide what they believe and how they interpret it because sometimes with movies when they make it too clear like the spell killed the father and now my is if they made it too clear it would be boring i kind of like when we're able to have a discussion on what happened just so we can see alternate perspectives so y'all let me know down below what y'all think happened because i'm sure i'm probably missing something i probably need to watch the movie again and then again i'm sure each time i watch the movie i'm going to catch on to something different um, am i like missing a certain detail is there any other movies you feel like i should watch and dissect like this but i feel like this was a good choice I feel that people can utilize voodoo to kill individuals i honestly don't i feel like we are capable of anything we are magical beings with if we set our intention but i feel like there's a limit to it when it comes to playing with father time and playing god and I believe that just because I believe I did a video on our spiritual contracts, basically that contract that we symbolically sign right when we're born that decides the day we are born, who we're going to be in the day that we die. I feel like that's an official contract. It can't be broken. It can't be twisted. Whatever happens was meant to happen. That's destiny. So that's why I feel like when it comes to putting spells on people to use it to your advantage, you're basically in breach of contract. So you have to deal with the karma. But I feel like which the day you were born, the day you die are like solid, can't be twisted, can't be manipulated with. But you guys let me know down below. Do you guys know of any cases where you've seen it happen? And so that's why you believe it actually can happen. Let me know down below. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. Our spiritual recap on Eve's Bayou. Please let me know what y'all think down below. Because I feel like maybe I'm missing something. I want to hear a different perspective that'll make me go, mmm, I can see how that happened. So let's talk down below. And like I always say, as above, so below, as within, so without, as the universal, the soul. Until next time, you guys, I'm Shay. Baby. 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 Baby.